let's get started. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, what for us here in Amsterdam is a very, very sunny and warm, uh, beautiful June day. Uh, but I understand at least from our speaker who is in Lancaster that it's raining. <laughs> so um, uh, welcome again to the Hot Politics Lab. Uh, as you can see, one person is missing from our usual crowd of uh, four people. Uh, Bert Bakker, uh, don't be afraid, he does not have corona. He's not ill, he just went to a hairdresser. And uh, he should be here any minute now. And uh, we can all uh, look at the, the results. Um, okay, um, uh, I will skip introducing uh, what we do in the lab because we've done this so many times now online uh, that we can skip that part and I can jump immediately to announcing our speaker, Ryan Boyd uh, from Lancaster uh, University. Um, I'm really happy to have Ryan today here because, uh, as you know, we, uh, we focus on, 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 on political psychology. That's the big theme in our lab. And, uh, and a lot of that work uh, uses surveys, experiments to uh, analyze human behavior. But there's so much human behavior out of, uh, uh, around us, texts that we produce all the time. And, and, and I think we really underutilize that, uh, uh, that data source. And so, and Ryan is, is, is one of the people who is really leading the agenda of how psychology can use uh, text to understand things like motivations or personality of people. And I think that's, that's a really important uh, agenda. So I'm really happy to uh, have him here today to talk uh, 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 a little bit more about his, uh, his projects that he's doing. Uh, he has already uh, published a whole bunch of exciting work. I got to know his name through uh, a, 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 a publication in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences where they examined together with a bunch of co-authors the long-term trends in, in, in political language of, of, of leaders over time. Uh, but he has published in a, in, in a very diverse mix, I should say, of, uh, of uh, 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 um, psychology, computer science, uh, general science, journals, even a journal called Dreaming uh, that I'm very curious about that is uh, um, so um, yeah uh, without further ado uh, I want to invite uh, Ryan to take the floor and 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 uh, you will take 15 20 minutes and then we can do the Q&A and, and and you know feel free during the talk to already write your question in the Q&A so I can immediately start with that question once we're done all right Ryan the floor is yours all right let me go ahead and see if I can get this going not too awkwardly can you see my screen okay great well first thank you for having me um it's it's always a joy to talk about this stuff so i am a computational social scientist slash behavioral scientist slash social psychologist um, as mentioned most of my research revolves around studying people's words, their verbal behavior in all of its forms. And this is going to be probably much more kind of casual and, and we'll say looser talk than what I would usually give. It's, it's always kind of tricky when you don't have a strongest sense of who the audience is to know exactly what, they, what they're curious about or want to know. So really my, my plan here is to just give a, a fairly superficial overview of my broad area, the, the kind of really big umbrella under which most of my research falls and, and the people that I work with. And what I'm gonna do is try to start just very broadly and define what do I even mean by psychology of verbal behavior. Then I'm going to dig a little bit deeper and give some more specific examples uh, within kind of just general psychology. And then narrow in and talk a little bit about what this stuff looks like in the, the political psych domain and just kind of, I, I say political psych, but so it's an, even that's kind of a vague label, I would say. Um, just research on politics broadly, broadly defined. So, these days, uh, you know, we used to call it psychology of language, we used to call it um, language psychology and other various names. Lately, we've really taken to calling it the psychology of verbal behavior. So this isn't necessarily psycholinguistics where we're trying to understand 
language comprehension or speech generation or anything like that. What we really care about is the actual verbal behavior, by which I mean anything a person does involving language to some degree or another. It's everything that you say out loud, everything that you type, post to social media, any letters you write. you've sent, how do these things inform our understanding of your thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, affect, behavior, and cognition? Now, most of the work that's been done in this area for really a long time, and definitely for the past 30 or 40 years, um, sits somewhere between personality and social psychology. And so what this means is that when we're analyzing language samples, what we're really doing is treating your language as um, a, relative, a relatively stable indicator of these psychological processes. So we're essentially taking this social behavior, language being an inherently social activity, and then co-opting it to try to use as a window to deeper psychological processes. And when I say that we treat these as stable indicators, we know from a lot of research that the patterns in our verbal behavior are fairly stable over time. And so we might, for example, take the amount of first person singular pronouns, the amount of I words that you're using, I, me, and my, and we take that as a stable metric of something about your psychology. So you would say that you're a high or low self-referencer. And then we want to know what does this tell us about the person's psychology? Does this mean that they're narcissistic? Does it mean that they're insecure, that they're depressed? Are they um, do they do high self-referencers make decisions differently than low self-referencers? Do high self-referencers react to certain message framings differently than low self-referencers and so on? Now, most of the work in this area draws from some, some pretty basic concepts um, in language and kind of the philosophy of language. So generally speaking, at its simplest level, we think about words as a reflection of a person's kind of broad psychological subjective experiences. That's generally speaking why most people agree we have language in the first place, is to take the, this kind of stream of consciousness that we have and patch it up into meaningful units that we can share with other people and provide meaning to ourselves. And we use language kind of operating under one of several theories to try to understand uh, really what's going on under the hood. Some of these frameworks are, are very classic, so we know that language is a window into people's mental habits. Um, so if you're the type of person who generally thinks in a kind of positive, upbeat way, we know this corresponds to how you talk as well. And so we can essentially reverse engineer that. We look at your language and then infer what your mental habits are from that. We also call this kind of the carpenter's toolbox theory that, you know, the, the words that you keep closest and most on hand and that you use most often reflect the tasks that you need to do psychologically um, most often. We also know that language reflects a person's expertise or interest. So, uh, you know, if you've ever heard the, the old myth that Inuit people have 50 different words for snow, it's not true, but the general idea underlying this is that um, people are curious and, uh, you know, people, the Inuit people, their whole landscape was consisted of different types of snow. And so they would, um, their, their language reflected their kind of inherent curiosity about the world around them. Another kind of less strained examples is some work from Levi Strauss, where he found that the indigenous people in the Philippines, um, they had a far larger vocabulary for things than what they needed. They could easily name about 500 different uh, varieties of plants, over 20 different types of ants, far more than what they needed to actually survive. So the idea was, again, the people are curious about the world around them, and their language reflects essentially what they're paying attention to and, and what they're really interested in their day-to-day -day lives. And then 
kind of ironically one of the, the oldest theories of language. It goes back way before psychology was even a field and has started to see some revival recently. And you see this theory emerge practically in every era of psychology is that a person's words not only reflect their experiences and interests and mental habits, also shape uh, a person's experiences. Um, so we don't really believe like this hard Worfian theory anymore where the words that you use kind of in a very um, deterministic way ref shape what you experience and what you can think. But we know that, um, for example, a lot of this work deals with emotion labeling. Kind of by definition, once you've decided to assign a label to how you're feeling, if, you, if you're in a high arousal state and you say, I think I'm afraid right now, or I think I'm anxious, or I think I'm stressed, those labels, in a way, by definition, then guide how you subjectively experience that state. And you have this kind of mutually reinforcing process where your language kind of weakly shapes your experience and your experiences kind of weakly shape your language. Now, when we talk about using language data to measure things about people's psychology, there are a couple of different ways we think about this. Sometimes um, this can range in a very complicated direction, um, which is uh, probably a more accurate way to think about it, where we see language is just one of several different ways to measure things about people. So, you know, you mentioned in, in the introduction, um, or maybe it was when we were talking before, self-report measures being kind of the, the standard um, for capturing these really complex phenomena that we care about in psychology. And really all social sciences um, have been, I would say, over-reliant on self-report questionnaires to try to measure things for a long, long time now. And of course, you know, a common question that a person would raise is, how, how do you even know these self-report questionnaires are really tapping into these objective things we care about? And so one, one way we think about language is just one of several different ways of measuring things. Language is one pathway to measuring things like cognition, um, prejudices, emotions. You could also use self-report questionnaires. You could use observer metrics. You could um, really look at any kind of the, the vast array of human behavior. And so when we think about language this way from a, what I would call a behavioral sciences perspective, most of the work that I do and the way that we would talk about language is just part of this really kind of big world of behavior um, that, that people engage in on a moment to moment, day by day, week by week basis. And so we're using this one very specific area of a person's behavioral repertoire to work our way up to just their general behavioral psychology and therefore their, their broader psychology. And in that way too, we could take these types of behaviors here. I have no idea if my, my mouse actually shows up on when I'm sharing screens. Okay, good. You know, we could take these bits of behavior and concurrently measure them with these types of behaviors and these types of behaviors and these types of behaviors. And we can put these all together to form a very high dimensional, high resolution image of how a person behaves and moves through the world and then use that to infer other things about their psychology. A much simpler and cleaner way of thinking about language data in psychology is just that it is a type of behavior that also kind of lucky for us is really closely yoked to a person's cognition and their feelings as well. So it's one thin slice of a person's psychology that's generally informative about other areas of their psychology. Now I'll walk you through a few examples of what this looks like at a very broad level within psychology. And really the types of questions we're often trying to answer with language. So from a behavioral sciences perspective, again, often what we're trying to do is we're trying to use a person's language as a proxy for their, their general mental habits and see how those relate to some type of objective outcomes. Um, so this can include things like person's health behaviors, how long they live, how they make decisions, what products they buy, who they vote for, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're trying to kind of quantify these thinking styles and then map them onto um, downstream outcomes, in particular by bypassing traditional methods. So often we try to avoid using self-report questionnaires. We're not trying to use language to map onto subjective experiences so much as we're trying to essentially capture thought 
and use that to understand something that happens later, something that the person does. And so one area where we've had really good traction with this is studying people's values. Um, values supposed to be, in theory, um, the things that a person thinks is important. So things like working hard and honesty. And uh, this is supposed to be very closely linked to a person's behavior. So if you value honesty, if you think honesty is important, and then you find out that a politician is dishonest, in theory, that violation of the value of honesty should make you more likely to vote for someone else. Now, traditionally, values are studied pretty much exclusively with self-report questionnaires. Um, and they, they really don't ever map this stuff onto objective behavior. And in, in a series of studies that we've done over the past you know, five or six years or so, we find that when we measure people's values, what is important to them through their verbal behavior, through their language, um, whether it's social media language, so just the stuff that they've posted on Facebook, or in more controlled settings where we explicitly ask people, you know, write about what is important to you, the things that guide your day-to-day -day, um, behaviors and judgments and so on. Um, when we get language about people's values and quantify it that way, it maps directly onto their behavior, often in very kind of clean, predictable ways. And so if we, you know, I'm gonna really kind of skip over the specifics of this, but in this box here on the top, these are the kind of classic Schwartz values measured from the Schwartz value survey. And these are uh, values that we've extracted with text analysis. And these dots are all the relationships between values measured this way and this way mapped onto the actual behaviors that people report engaging in. Uh, I think this was um, throughout the past week or something like that. We find not only much broader coverage, so not only can we predict far more behaviors from people's language, um, but we can do so much, much more strongly than even via self-report questionnaires. And another way that we might talk about this is measuring people's schemas or their schemata. So how people think about a certain thing, the, essentially the structure of people's thoughts around certain topics. So uh, together with, with a number of different labs, we've looked at things like sexual psychopathology. How do people think about their own sexual behavior uh, when they can translate that into words? So we might ask people to write for 20 minutes about what sex means to them. And then we can map this actually very directly onto sexual psychopathology, people who have some type of sexual dysfunction, um, adult survivors of sexual abuse and so on. We can see how they think about certain topics and measure how those different kind of nodes of thought or different domains of thought map onto their pathology. Um, and the same is true even for things like health behaviors. So we've looked at how people in different cities uh, talk about food, not even when in any specific like health context, just how do they talk about food uh, with their friends and colleagues. And we find that the way they talk about food relates to, I think in this study, it was state level, maybe it was city level health metrics, indices of things like obesity, oh, uh, excuse me, getting choked up, talking about food, things like obesity and, uh, you know, heart disease and so on. We found pretty good correspondence there. And lastly, we often use language to look at things like social cognition and how that relates to actual behavior. So this is uh, a study that's impressed, should be hopefully coming out in the next few weeks, maybe a month or so, maybe longer. But what we're doing here is measuring um, how people tell stories and how the stories unfold over time, the structure of stories. And in particular, what we've started looking at is how the structure of a story changes as a function of the relationship between the speaker and the audience. So if I am talking to someone that I'm already very familiar with, if we're close friends, I don't need to give you a lot of background information. Whereas contrarily, if I'm talking to a group of complete strangers, like if you've ever um, known anyone who just starts talking about someone and you have no idea who the hell they're talking about, like, oh, Sally did this and then she said this, you have to stop them like, I don't know who that is. I have zero context to understand what you're talking about. Um, we can see those types of patterns unfolding in people's stories and how they tell them. And just probably for the sake of time, I think we're going to jump ahead here 
but we can also look at people's language when they're talking to other people, measure what they think of the other person, whether they see them a certain way or not, as well as the person's intention. So we've, we've done a pretty good job showing that based on interactions between online sexual predators and uh, their targets, the people they think are children that they're trying to lure into a sexual relationship, we can actually tell which of these people are kind of more aggressive, um, less remorseful, and more likely to reoffend based on the ways in which they're verbally engaging with their, their uh, presumed victims. Now in recent years, um, we've started to see kind of a reemergence of this stuff in, in political psychology. Now, most of the, the work that I've seen in, in the past, we'll say 10 years or so, that, that's dealing with politics flows from a lot of the logic that I've just kind of walked through it very vaguely speaking. Um, you know, for example, when, when we're talking about analyzing verbal behavior in, a, in any domain related to politics, we're usually not looking at rhetoric. Um, we're, we're talking much more about measuring individual differences, measuring a person's personality, um, their ideology, and trying to not just measure it. We're not trying to measure if somebody's liberal versus conservative, but we're also trying to go deeper and understand why. What are the underpinnings of a person's ideological leanings, the underpinnings of uh, political behavior and so on through their verbal behavior. And, you know, in, in, from a very kind of classic personality perspective, this is just using language to understand ideological differences. So um, with, with several colleagues over the past several years, this is a lot of stuff I was working on very early in grad school, uh, predominantly with Adam Fetterman, who's, who's a brilliant researcher in this area. You know, we try to understand why are some people liberal and why are some people conservative. And we've been able to use their verbal behavior and link that back to a broader psychological theory about individual differences. And so this involves things like, you know, we might ask people to um, do a very specific task in a lab study. You know, when you think about people, what do you think about, right, for 10 minutes? Um, we've also collected data from chat rooms, for example, and, and even kind of somewhat surprisingly, you know, one of these studies, I think we were uh, collecting data from the older people might remember IRC, Internet Relay Chat, it's kind of old school chat rooms, essentially. Um, and, you know, we would collect data from people talking in liberal versus conservative chat rooms and Somewhat actually surprising to me at the time, although it makes sense now, is, you know, I expected these people to be having really intense political discussions. Um, but when you look at the transcripts, they're just people, they're just talking, you know, you go into a conservative chat room, most of these people are just saying, oh, you know, hey, Bob, what's up? Not much, just finished having dinner with the family, what are you up to? Oh, not much, and, you know, watch a little TV, then go out in the workshop and, and work on my car or something like that. Nothing inherently political. I mean, these are just people, right? Um, nevertheless, we can see political kind of psychological signatures as a function of these chat rooms that we see elsewhere as well. We see um, that in general, for example, liberals tend to be much more future oriented in their language. Conservatives tend to be much more past oriented. And we see this in these kind of innocuous chat rooms. We see it when we give people experimental tasks in the lab. We see it in State of the Union addresses in the US. And so all of these types of studies are using verbal behavior in, in all of its forms to try to understand what are the psychological underpinnings of these ideological differences. And often we'll also zoom this up to broader levels. So uh, as mentioned in the introduction, here's a study uh, that I did with Kayla Jordan, who's now at Harrisburg University where we were tracking trends in political leaders over time. In particular, trying to understand, are there psychological differences that have changed? Or I'm sorry, are there psychological differences that have emerged over time in, in uh, political leaders in the US and elsewhere? And can we see this in the different people's language? And, you know, here, what we're really doing is we're trying to infer broader sociopolitical trends. So the, the changes in who is getting elected to the US presidency, for example, reflects changes in how the general public um, thinks about and what expectations they have for 
leaders of political office. And, and Kayla, the first author on this, has done some other uh, really great work as well, looking at things like how analytic um, a leader's language is and how that relates to who wins or is perceived to win debates and win nominations from their party and so on. Um, brilliant research. I, I highly recommend looking at, at her work as well. And I have a feeling I'm probably running well over time, so I'll, I'll I think I'll skip this slide um, and maybe we can talk about it in, in discussion if it comes up. And then this is like the weakest conclusion I've had. Very hand wavy points, just essentially re summarizing um, what I've said thus far, where, you know, from a psychological perspective, when we're talking about verbal behavior, we're not just trying to kind of measure things about what a person is saying. It's not the, the kind of superficial content of a person's thought. We're trying to understand deeper psychological processes from patterns in their verbal behavior. And a lot of this stuff is kind of a no brainer um, for being transplanted into political domains because it's so closely linked to individual differences and social processes and so on. Um, and I think I'll go ahead and stop there and we can, we can transition into q and I don't want to be that academic who is given 20 minutes to talk and goes on for like an hour and a half. So I'll, I'll call it there. Thanks a lot, Ryan. Uh, this, this was a great talk. Uh, I think lots of uh, food for thought and, and uh, I think it's particularly nice that you gave a big overview because uh, I don't think a lot of us are, are very familiar with uh, the whole uh, uh, specter of your of your work. Uh, I see now that Bert Bakker has joined us, but as an ordinary participant, um, I think, well, he tells us that that he cannot join as a, as a host, but I think his haircut is probably so terrible that <laughs> he, he doesn't want to uh, have the camera. Okay. Uh, hey, uh, so, oh, there are a couple of questions already. Uh, let me jump to those. Um, our first question is from Amanda Friesen. Uh, the question is, could you speak to linking psychology and language in formal versus informal settings, elites versus regular people? Mm, that's a good question. So there are, whew, it, it's a complicated topic, right? So there's, there are some things that we take as a general truism, um, and there's been some research that, that fleshes this out a bit. So when the context absolutely changes language patterns. Um, so if we're measuring people, the same person talking in a formal context versus an informal context, we expect there to be differences. Um, and a lot of times those differences are, are content-based. So the, I, this is like low-hanging fruit to make a joke. Generally speaking, you'd expect a politician when they're giving a speech to not talk about like raunchy sexual behaviors and so on. United States excluded. Um, <laughs> whereas, you know, you may expect to see more of that in, in casual conversation or more informal interactions that they're having with other people. So in some cases, the, the types of things that we'd expect to see in language change. That said, um, everything is fairly relative. So what we find is that if I am I if I'm a person who's a high self-referencer, for example, so if I use First person singular pronouns, like a four and a half percent rate. Um, just when I'm talking with my friends and writing emails and things like that, those numbers will often shift as a function of context, but pretty much everyone else's does as well. So if I'm a high self-referencer in an informal context, I'll still be relative to other people, a high self-referencer in a more formal context as well. Um, now that's that's kind of a hand wavy response in a in a certain way. Um, there are there are other complications that emerge, especially for more formal contexts. And the big one really is um, in in today's world, whose language is it, right? So like I've done some personality work looking at things like entrepreneurs and and um, managers for major companies and CEOs and things like that. And we'll collect their, their tweets from, from Twitter. And there's always this kind of nagging worry in the back of your mind um, about like, well, who actually wrote these tweets? Are we actually measuring this person's psychology or someone else's? 
And the same is true in political context, especially when you're looking at kind of formal rhetoric, like, you know, are, are we looking at, uh, you know, US president's language? Are we looking at kind of the, the speech writers, this whole like political machinery that went into engineering the speech? Um, and it gets more complicated uh, in, in those contexts. I have no idea if that actually answers the question or not. Um, so I'll stop there at, at risk of rambling too much. If not, Amanda, like you can uh, you can uh, write another question. I <laughs> uh, actually, yeah, I do have a couple of questions uh, in a row that I think are are sort of uh, variants on what what Amanda just asked. So the next question is from uh, Camille Beukebaum. Uh, nice to see you, Camille. Um, question is uh, first comment. Thanks, great talk. Question is, language use is for a large part determined by context, situation, medium, conversation, partner, etc. How do you know whether the language they produce steps into affect cognition or values? How do you deal with this in your study? That's a good question. Um, so often what we find, and I, this is kind of restating what I said before, but context often affects a bit of the content. Um, so certain domains are more likely or less likely to come up as a function of, of context. So, you know, what the situation is, who you're talking to, and so on. Um, but that's not universally true for language. So there's, and this is something I didn't really get into in the talk, but we also have these two broad things that we talk about with language. Um, we, we make this very kind of ham-fisted distinction between content and style. Um, so content very much is the, the what of language, mostly different types of nouns and verbs. Um, whereas the style is much more reflected in what we'd call particles or function words. And these are things that are uh, much, much less sensitive to context. So um, we have this, this measure that I kind of mentioned in passing called analytic thinking, which is generally um, marked by high rates of articles and prepositions. So articles and prepositions are something that they're essentially signifiers of concepts and their interrelations. And they're also really, really hard to control consciously. So um, if I asked you how many times I said the word sex since I've been on here, you can probably ballpark it pretty well, I don't know, maybe three or four times. If I ask you how many times I used the word the, I, I don't even know how many times I've used that word in the past 60 seconds, let alone in this entire talk. And that's probably, of every word I've used, I've probably used the word the at a way higher rate than every other word. Um, and so these are the types of things that are fairly stable and tell us a lot about a person and how they're thinking in particular that are relatively inflexible to context um, or especially kind of those specific cues. Now that said, if we're, if we're nailing down to do a, a lab study, then we'll try to control for all those factors and have a a very fixed um, set of conditions under which the verbal behavior is being elicited. Okay. Thanks. Uh, next question, Marika van der Velde. Cool stuff. Following up, up on both Amanda and Camille, could you please elaborate a bit on the different ways you analyze the different types of texts you're collecting in terms of comparative methods? Mm -hmm. For instance, in diaries or 10 minutes essays versus um, uh, State of the Union speeches. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's there's there is a big difficult question. Um, so I didn't get into this. What I usually say is uh, toolbox. Use a toolbox approach to language analysis. So there's natural language processing is a massive field, and it ranges from fairly simple methods that are kind of word counting specific concepts that you're already looking for to these really in computationally intensive data-driven approaches. Um, the, the problem that I think the field has generally suffered, both psychology and kind of outside of social sciences more broadly, is that people get really married to one method and they just, there's the, the classic adage that when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, so that said, I, I would say that the specific analytic methods often are more going to be about what your research question is than the actual data source. There, there's some caveats to that. 
So if we are looking for like emotional content of text, there's a million kind of affective lexica out there. So you can just kind of take them and plug and play. And you can go to more hardcore neural net, like kind of estimation methods for sentiments and things like that. But at the end of the day, like if you measure it eight different ways and correlate them all together, we're gonna intercorrelate it like 0 0.8, 0 0.9, something like that. So it doesn't really matter. Um, if it's more, if the goal of a study is more to, I would say, kind of extract certain types of meaning from text. So if we're looking for very specific types of concepts and it's more, we're more looking to generate theory than test theory, we would use an entirely different set of methods. Um, now these can range from kind of classic dictionary-based word counting approaches. So very simple. We have lists of words that we're looking to measure certain things with um, to things like topic modeling, where we're, we're taking a data set in a very kind of hands-off a theoretical way, just saying what, what emerges from this data set. And even in the, the kind of slides I went through, um, there's probably three or four different methods I used across those studies alone, just kind of based on what specifically we were looking for. That's not a super helpful answer, I know. Um, and this, is, this comes up a lot with, with text analyses, as I always say, it depends, but I also generally recommend um, err on the simpler side uh, wherever possible for, for two reasons. Um, the first reason is that if you're actually trying to understand a phenomenon more deeply, if you're using really complicated NLP methods, it can get very black boxy very quickly to where you, you can do a great job predicting something but it doesn't mean you're necessarily any closer to understanding it. Whereas if you're using simpler methods, they lend themselves a bit better to kind of taking the pieces apart and trying to figure out what's going on um, with a person. And you can always start simple and, and scale up to more complicated. Uh, that's good advice. Um, the next question is for, is for Christian. Uh, thanks, Ryan. That's really super interesting stuff. Um, I was wondering if you do this long-term analysis over like 200 years, as you showed in that PNAS paper, um, how do you deal with uh, the change of language itself over these long time periods? Or is that a an issue when you look at particles? Um, does the usage of particles not change over time at all? That's a really good question. Um, so there's, there's two answers to this. On the one hand, when we're looking at especially really, really old texts, we have to go through and uh, essentially kind of automatically modernize the spelling. Um, in particular, like anything in, in, you know, for example, the English language, um, anything going back before like the 1700s or so, there, people didn't used to think of words as having like an objectively correct way to spell them. So like when you go to like artistic writing, like playwrights and stuff like that, the same guy will spell a word like eight different ways within the same play. And you're just like, what the hell are you, just be consistent, please. Um, so for really old texts, often we have to go through a process where we kind of manually, semi-manually update the spelling. Now that said, when we're, when we're looking at the, the stylistic components of language, particles, function words, those are in general really, really resistant to change over time. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of reasons for why that's the case, and I'll uh, skip over the details of that. But when we're, so a lot of these measures of what we call thinking style that are based on function words, um, those are fairly stable over even periods of like many hundreds of years because the word the is the word the for, you know, basically forever. They, because they're so common, they, they don't change nearly as often. Okay, great. Um, next question is from Matthijs Rodijn. Uh, thanks, Ryan. This is very interesting. I immediately, <clears throat> I immediately believe that these measures of verbal behavior have many advantages compared to self-reports. But I can also imagine that they are very time-consuming and therefore very expensive if you aim for representative samples. Would you tell us more about how you think this issue could be tackled in future studies? Mm, that's a good question. So I would say a little, it depends a little bit. So like 
you know, I can speak best from a psychological perspective where often, you know, we'll go in, if we're trying to collect a really large representative sample, the, the amount of time and energy it takes for people to fill out a, a massive battery of kind of filling in the bubble questionnaires is brutal, right? Like if you've ever taken part in one of these studies and you're asked to fill out like 300 questions, you, your, your brain just shuts off after like five minutes of it. And then you still have another hour to go through this. Now, you know, it, that, especially like, let's say you're using something like Prolifica or Mechanical Turk. So you're, you're paying people to participate in the study. Um, paying people to do that for an hour, hour and a half, that can get really time consuming and expensive. Now, what you can do instead of giving someone, you know, 200 or 300 fill in the bubble questions is just ask them to write about something for a couple of minutes. Um, and in a way, that is, you know, the, the, in psychology, the idea of self-report questionnaires stems from this idea that's, in a way, kind of casual and common sense. If you want to know what a person is like, just ask them, you know, do you like going to parties? Do you like um, watching movies? What's your favorite genre of music? The same logic still applies here. If you want to know what a person really thinks or, or how they talk or anything like that, you can just ask them to, to say in their own words. And so in a way, um, you can cut out a lot of hassle and expense um, in data collection if you're like curating a sample from a, a broad population. Um, and then, you know, the actual analytic process, most of the, the language analyses that we use these days are, the, the, the computational methods have gotten pretty good. So you can do the actual analyses in fairly hands-off ways without it being this kind of long, you know, you have a team of hand coders going through and scoring each text for different concepts. Um, so on the one hand, I would say it can be cheaper, um, or at least, we'll say comparable if you want to be really pessimistic about it. Um, and then the, the other kind of solution that you have for stuff like this is the internet. You know, the internet is largely language data and you can go and carry really massive samples with minimal effort. Um, now how representative they are can be a, a difficult question. You know that we know that virtually every platform you might sample from Twitter versus Reddit versus Facebook are all kind of skewed or biased in one way versus another. But, um, you know, if, you, if you're aware of those biases going into it, you can do to some degree uh, some controlling for that. Okay, thanks. Um, now, uh, a question for me. <laughs> yeah. uh, I was particularly interested in one of the publications you showed on um, power and affiliation. Can you tell us a bit more about this study? Oh man, I'm trying to remember <laughs> everything about it. Too long ago. <laughs> so that one, I I believe that was Adam Fetterman was the first author on it, and this was essentially a, a, an individual differences study where we were, um, it, at the end of the day, we were really revisiting um, kind of the, a lot of the classic. What I think these days people might call like needs theory or drives theory or something like that. You know, classic um, David McClellan's research and so on. I'm trying to understand um, whether there's any merits to this idea that there are kind of core underlying motivational differences um, between people who are who skew towards conservative versus liberal. Um, and what we found in general was. I don't remember what all samples we used. I think for that one, we had five or six different samples. I think that one we did look at State of the Union addresses, maybe State of the State addresses. And then I, I'm, I'm pretty sure we had a lab sample and maybe the chat rooms in that one as well. Um, but you know, what we found was that in general, there were, and these are very general patterns. These are not like massive effect sizes or anything like that. Um, but that people who skewed towards conservative ideology tended to be motivated more by power concerns, whereas um, liberals were, were much more driven by affiliative concerns. Um, now that, you know, I think some people have taken that 
to mean that, oh, conservatives are power hungry monsters and liberals are all kind of bleeding heart, lovey dovey, they care about people thing, which isn't, you know, if you, if you look at it from a very classic motives perspective, that's not exactly what we're saying. It's, it's much more that people um, are attentive to these issues in their kind of psychological environment. So, you know, if I'm sure that probably most people in the audience are familiar with the concept of like social dominance orientation, and, you know, is a classic one. You know, this maps very cleanly onto things like power motives, where it's just that as you engage with the social world around you, this is what you're attentive to. It's not necessarily that you are motivated to acquire power. It's that you are, are kind of keyed into social power structures around you. And that these are these are things that you're very motivated to fall in line with. Um, and that, that was the general finding uh, of, okay. of that one. Okay, interesting. Thanks. Um, I have a question from Tess Lunkhausen. Uh, she says, hi, really interesting talk, thank you. I was wondering if there is also research studying verbal behavior in different cultural contexts and in languages other than English, and if results established among English speakers hold in other languages and across cultures. Mm, that's a really good question. So there is um, a good amount of work. This is, I mean, like, like everywhere. Um, especially in psychology, but I think in, in a lot of social sciences, uh, it's very, we'll say Western centric and US centric and, and for verbal behavior research, very, very English centric. One reason for that is that English language is actually, relatively speaking, pretty simple to, to deal with computationally, um, relative to something like Mandarin Chinese or Arabic or something like that. That said, um, a lot of the, the kind of core findings on psychological research and verbal behavior do seem to translate fairly well across languages. So one of the, the most robust and reliable um, findings, just period, is that uh, first person singular pronouns are correlated pretty, pretty modestly, but very reliably with depression. So people who self-reference it at high rates uh, are much more likely to, to be diagnosed with depression and anxiety disorders and so on. And that's something that holds up across Spanish and Chinese and a little bit of research I think I've seen in Korean and a bit of French and Turkish. It, it just kind of holds up across the board. A lot of the, so a lot of those types of findings have been at least kind of ported to other languages and tested to make sure that it's not just something particular to, to the English language itself. Um, now there are caveats to that. Um, there, there's been, uh, I would say a lot of the, the more recent stuff, the really purely data-driven techniques, because they're language agnostic, people just, what you see often is that, um, You'll have somebody typically with like a computer science or information science background, they'll just kind of run a big model. And they're not really concerned with the, the content of it. They just generate a model from the language data, throw it at the wall and see what sticks. And there's so much of that type of research. And I, I'm not trying to be diminutive because there's, there's value in that. It's just a totally different goal, um, the, the types of problems they're trying to solve. But a lot of that work has not really been ported across languages. Um, I think there's a lot of work to do there. There's also some interesting work that kind of sits in the intersection of looking at how these things are expressed differently in different languages. Um, but that's a whole other topic in and of itself. Okay, um, another uh, question from Camille Beukeboom. Uh, do you always validate your computational methods by means of hand-coded sets? When would you say this is necessary and when can it be skipped? Ooh, so I would say, I would say we don't always validate them with hand-coded. So we don't, we definitely don't always validate them with hand-coding methods um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, in, in some cases, we don't necessarily need to. So like for a lot of the function word stuff, um, the word the is the word the. There's, there's, there's no really deeper way to read into it. Like, well, when they said the, did they mean it this way or did they mean it that way? 
So for some types of language, it's really not necessary. Um, for other types of, of language measures, it depends on what we're trying to capture. So uh, there's been a good amount of work on uh, like moral psychology and moral concerns and how that's expressed in language uh, by my colleague, Morteza Degani, who's at University of Southern California. And for them, a lot of their work recently in particular has really been based around the, the absolute need to score texts manually, to really know that they're capturing what they think they're capturing. Um, I would say, uh, whew, this is a really big topic. I'm trying to think like how little I can get away with saying here. So I would say in general, so for me personally, a lot of the stuff that I use, I don't go back and manually validate it these days because the findings are so reliable and they've been so well established that you just kind of take it at face value like any other method that like, you know, more than likely this is capturing this construct in this context because it always seems to. Um, in other cases, I, well, virtually in every case, I tell people you should still go in and do a qualitative gut check. Um, you know, especially for the more computational methods that are generating insights out of the data, it's really tempting and really easy to just look at these like word clusters that fall out of your data set and say like, oh, that's a, clearly they're talking about X, Y, or Z. Um, but it, it's, you're doing yourself a disservice and you're doing really kind of the whole process a disservice if you don't really dig in and look like, okay, let's take the top 10 texts, the top 10 scoring texts for this theme or this measure, and let's have three or four people go in and actually see if they can tell, you know, what this means. Are they seeing it as well? And keep them all blind. Because if, if it's something that, um, people don't see or don't agree on, then you have an, an empirical issue that, that you have to solve. Um, you know, ultimately, especially for a lot of language stuff, if it's not face valid, you've got a pretty big problem. I'll stop there. Okay, good. Um, because we have one more question and it's, uh, it's, it's like a big picture question. So I think that's an excellent question to finish with. And it's from uh, Martijn Schoenfelder. Uh, the, uh, he writes, this is really interesting, thanks. I was wondering, could you say a bit more about where you think language research in psychology is headed? What in your view are currently the exciting open questions? Oh, that's a, I love and hate these types of questions. No, I have to actually put in extra thought. Oh, let's see. So there's a few things going on here. So I'll, I'll speak broadly. I think about what some current shortcomings are. So I'll start with that and then I'll, I'll go from there. Um, you know, one thing that I think is a, a currently bubbling area in, in psychology of verbal behavior, that there hasn't, there, there's been a shockingly small amount of work in this space is actual social psychology the actual interactions between people and trying to understand those, the, the kind of deeper psychology um, using automated language analyses. You can find exceptions of pockets there, or I should say pockets of exceptions where, um, you know, there's been a, a okay amount of work looking at how people like coordinate uh, verbally or, you know, what politeness looks like in language, things like that. But the actual kind of deeper underlying processes that, that go into how people interact, there hasn't been a whole lot of work there, which to me is surprising because like, if you say it went, I don't know, before I started doing this stuff as like my research, my career, if you were to tell me that some psychologists analyze language, you kind of assume it has to do with like how people talk to each other, right? As opposed to, oh, we're just going to have somebody write down on a piece of paper and try to infer their personality from that. So I think that's an area that, that uh, is, is sorely underdeveloped. And it's, I would say, over the past maybe just three or four years, there's started to be this gradual increase in this area. So I think this is somewhere that it's going very rapidly. Um, I also think that there's a lot of other 
I, I can't really give a timeline. There are a lot of other kind of linguistic -y types of things in, in um, verbal behavior that are thought to be really important, but we just don't have the tools to, to get at these yet. So um, things like sarcasm, things like metaphors, we're, we're really, really bad at, at quantifying these um, right now. And I, metaphors is a great example because there's, metaphors are, are, have for a long time been a pretty mainstay area in social psychology and even personality psychology. Um, they're thought to really capture a fundamental way that we engage with the world around us, but we don't have a good way to, to even capture these in an automated fashion. The, the one guy who's tried really going in and, and doing serious stuff there is actually the guy that, that I mentioned before that I've done um, like the power and affiliation stuff. Adam Fetterman, one of his main areas of research is metaphors and how that relates to um, I think he's done some work on how it relates to like ideology and other political processes, but just broader social psychology. And so there's a lot of things like that where, you know, as psychologists, we're kind of sitting around waiting for computer scientists to solve those problems so that we can swoop in and use them very selfishly. Um, I don't know if that, that's a satisfying answer to the question, but it's, it's in the ballpark. No. Now these all sound like uh, like very interesting uh, questions that hopefully we'll, uh, we'll we'll get close to having an answer to in the next uh, decade or so. Uh, <laughs> hey Ryan, I want to thank you uh, for your talk. It's been really interesting and a pleasure uh, uh, talking to you. And I hope we can have uh, some more interactions in the future. Um, also because. Uh, you are uh, eligible to receiving this politics lab coffee mug as a thank you for uh, uh, giving the talk. Uh, but unfortunately, at this stage, I cannot ac even access my office. So, and that's where all the cups are. So, it will be a while. Uh, and and then by now, I have quite a long list of mugs. So, um, um, and uh, and and I think the, the the latest news is that we can access the building in 2021. So, uh, who knows? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, last thing I need to uh, do today is to um, uh, uh, announce the next uh, uh, meetings we'll have. Uh, we have two more meetings before the summer break. Uh, first, next week from 4 to 5 CET is with Chris Federico from the University of Minnesota. Uh, he will talk about collective narcissism as a basis for nationalism. It couldn't be more topical, I think. Um, and then the week after that, uh, we have two PhD students giving a talk, uh, Isabella Robasso and Tobias Rohrbach. Um, Isabella Robasso will talk about um, uh, her work on discrete emotional appeals in politics. Uh, we just started to collect data yesterday, so I'm, I'm really interested in uh, what we'll see there. Uh, and uh, also, uh, the, uh, Tobias Rohrbach, he will talk about using think aloud protocol analysis to explore the process of gendered candidate evaluation. So two very different, but, but very topical and exciting uh, projects. Um, I also want to thank all the participants today. Uh, wonderful questions. And um, yeah, and I'm just going to say, I look very forward to more uh, tonight to see some of the people present in the, in the room physically. It's going to be interesting. <laughs> okay, uh, so all the people not in Amsterdam, see you next week.